Who here was at the uh, high school BAC panel? I see a few. See if you. All right, awesome. The rest of you, thank you for coming today. I hope you had a great weekend. And uh, for those who are sports fans, congratulations on your local team getting yeah. to the final. Go yeah. Raptors! Yeah. Clever girls. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, dude, I saw the thing that somebody had that sign that said like. Uh, of the north or whatever, and it was upside down last night at the uh, Jurassic Park or wherever it is downtown. Yeah, uh, I love it. That's the love it. Toronto never change. Um, so, real quick disclaimer for those that just joined. I got a few people that got here early. I already told them. So, uh, welcome first off to writing, directing, and voicing an anime. Uh, my name is Josh Greeley. I'm a voice actor mostly. Been doing voice acting for about 15 years professionally, uh, and mostly in anime. Uh, I've also for about a Eight to ten years was a uh, ADR script writer for Foundation Entertainment and uh, AD Films and Sentai Filmworks and uh, also uh, Bay Zoom Entertainment out of LA. And uh, I've only directed, I've been a, I've been trained and worked as an assistant director of the show, but I've never actually, thank you so much, I've never actually uh, had a directing, an actual directing gig myself. So I try to get, whenever I do this panel and go to con, to get any of the other guests that are here that also have these experiences and they have more experiences in some fields than me to come and join. Unfortunately, every other person that's here this weekend had a panel or a, an autograph session at this exact time, so I'm flying solo here. I'm going to try my best to give you all the, the concise and correct information that I can to answer your questions. Um, if, uh, and I will try to fill an hour. If, uh, if you don't, however, feel free, you don't have to ask questions specifically related to writing, acting, or directing. Feel free to ask any questions about shows I've worked on or just uh, about the industry itself or anything that you have. This is also a general Q&A. Uh, since it's Sunday and this is a pretty, this is a pretty nice tight group and small room, I'm pretty sure we can all project instead of having to get up and use that microphone, right? Yeah. Everybody comfortable with projecting? All right, cool. So yeah, if you just want to, if you have a question, just raise your hand. Or, uh, yes. Uh, uh, feel free to film this. There's nothing bad about that or whatever. Pictures, fine. Yes. Hi. Hi. I wanted to ask you this question last year, but you weren't here. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I was sick. I hope you're feeling really better. Um, this one's just a little one, and then I have a question about voice acting. Okay. For your on ice. Yes. I figured you skated my whole life, and I asked nice. them last year, but you weren't here. Did you do any sort you of research? You keep music? rubbing that wound in. Right? <laughs> just, just, take salt, just take the salt out while you're at it. Okay, fine. Um, right. Did you do any sort of research to know what you were talking about when it came to what you were doing for figure skating? No. Didn't think so. No. <laughs> I still don't know. Oh, I have no idea while well, I found the point system works. I don't, none of it. I can't tell you the difference between a tri triple axle or a triple sow cow, but I know that Yuri looks good doing it. He does the same. My voice acting question, sorry to everyone. Yeah. Um, what do you recommend as someone who has been attempting to get into voice acting, but okay. hasn't been able to like find the right like opportunities? Where do you suggest going to look? Obviously, it's different in the states. But... Right. Uh, thank you. Oh, Vancouver. That's pretty much like, I mean, Vancouver actually, I think, is one of the best places right now, even more so than LA, to go in North America for voice work. Uh, some of the most popular cartoons that are made for Cartoon Network and for like Hasbro and Nickelodeon and stuff like that are made here. Okay. Are made in Vancouver. My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. The entirety of that show was made in Vancouver. Most of it was recorded in Vancouver with the exception of one cast member, Tara Strong, yeah. uh, who's out of LA. Uh, Freaking reboot. <laughs> from the 90s, like all I mean, dude, dude, I'm pretty sure that most, like a pretty good portion of some of the recent uh, Cartoon Network shows, like uh, 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 Steven Universe, or anything, would also be at least animated and sometimes recorded here as well. Like Vancouver is a hub for animation work uh, and just voice work in general. And the cool thing is, like, if, if you're going for animation and that's your, that's what you want to go for in terms of voice work, then yes, Vancouver, Dallas, L.A., New York, and Houston. Are kind of in North America. That's that's your go. Okay. That's where you go to. But the cool thing also is, if, if you're local here, you're also in the voice market for commercial and radio. And I mean, every major city is going to have some sort of voice market for commercial and, and uh, uh, radio and narration and industrials and stuff like that. So there's always a market to find. But if you're specifically looking for animation, it's just one of those five locations. Well, thank you. Yep. Yeah, you back. Yes. Um, sorry, I just... Uh, you're good.
Okay, bye. Bye. Um, bye. Uh, is there any good uh, advice you could give for someone who wants to start out with just um, like for practice of vocal range? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I, I actually did. Was anybody at my uh, Creating Voices panel yesterday? Okay, awesome. So, uh, I go over this on that, and actually, if you can, some people have recorded that panel and have it up on YouTube in its entirety, and I, I talk about a lot of stuff like that in terms of finding your range uh, and stuff like that. So, if you can go, just go search, uh, search Creating Voices, Josh Green, or something on YouTube, you should be able to find it. Um, I'll give you a, a little stuff of it. The, uh, for Getting your range to go wider, or lower, or higher, or lower, whatever you want to. Uh, it's it's you have to think of it the same way as like going to the gym. Uh, you know, when, when you start to if you're starting on weight, you know, you always start with a, a smaller weight than what's your. You always start with a smaller weight instead of going to the heaviest thing, right? Uh, and whenever you start to hurt, you stop and let your muscles rest and recuperate and get stronger, so that you can lift even more the next time. It's the same with vocal work and vocal range. Uh, whenever you uh, are practicing doing voices, and like, especially if you are trying to get your range to go higher, for example, try to find characters or find things that you can do to push that high range and it's talk in that high range, perform in that high range, but then the moment that it starts to hurt or your throat gets tight or whatever, stop immediately and drink some water, don't talk for like an hour or two, and don't do any more voice practicing for the rest of that day, and then you come back the next day and after a while, it'll just get easier and easier and easier, and the next thing you know, you'll just be able to get that high range without even thinking about it. Uh, same with low range, do whatever else. And, and, it's, and the cool thing is, like, once you start practicing and you start learning a lot more of like what your voice is capable of, you start to learn the little tricks that you know you can do in order to make a certain voice come out. It's, it's kind of the same thing as like uh, playing a video game for the first time, and after a while, you realize, oh, that's how that mechanic works. I also, and then you can figure out a way to like, you know, do it better, do it faster, more efficiently. And uh, again, it's it's more a matter of self-discovery and just constant practice at that point. So Thank you. you bet. And yes. Um, when you're recording, what do you use for your workflow? Is it just Pro Tools? Pro Tools is the end the, 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 the question was uh, what do you work for like workflow as a Pro Tools or anything like that? So for me at home, I use a program called Adobe Audition and a Razor Siren. A uh, gaming microphone, actually, because uh, like the cool thing is about a lot of these microphones, like the like the, the siren or the, uh, the the Yeti, the blue mic, the Yeti blue micro snowball. Um, they're actually really good quality microphones. Uh, you just need to kind of learn the tips and tricks with them. Uh, like the the siren, for example, has several different settings. One that's made specifically for recording voice work. Uh, it has stuff for it has a setting you can use for recording instruments, for recording two way conversations, but it also has a mono, uh, what's the word for cardioid mic setup where it just captures from this frontal cone in front of you. So if you set up in uh, if you set it up in like just a small office room or uh, into a closet or something, and you've got you just some egg crate or anything from Walmart, just put that over the walls or a really thick blanket, it'll work the same as a professional studio. You'll get this exact same quality. Um, do you do a lot of this work at home? I do a lot of work at home. Yeah, actually, you're almost actually these days. You're, uh, with the exception of dubbing anime, you are usually required to uh, have a home setup now. Like if if I ever did an audition for my agent for a commercial, it has to be done at home. Uh, if I ever did an audition, sometimes actually for anime or video games out of LA, I have to do it at home. I don't fly out there. I don't audition in person. Uh, any commercial is always done at home. Um, though sometimes they give you the option to come and audition in, in person, but it's very rare. Um, and yeah, program-wise, it really like Pro Tools is the industry standard. It's nice to learn that, but it's not necessary unless you're wanting to do stuff like Source Connect, which I really need to. I need to. That was gonna be my next question. You use that a lot. Or... I actually haven't established myself, I think, to the point where I can use Source Connect. Uh, where where? I bet these people would like to know what it is. Does anybody here not know what Source Connect is? Okay, so basically, okay, does anyone not know what Pro Tools is? Okay, so Pro Tools essentially, if you ever heard of Audacity, like it's one of those free downloadable Pro Tools is the mega version, but okay, you haven't heard of Audacity? Okay, well Audacity is also just a free program you can download, kind of like any of the sounds recording, like the basic sound recording uh, 
memo thing that you get on an iPhone or something. You just record it as a WAV file, you can cut it, paste it, do whatever. But it's not really, it doesn't have a whole lot of tools unless you really know how to use it. Pro Tools is the industry standard program that is used in Hollywood. In, in, uh, basically, if you work in any sort of entertainment and you need to record audio, Pro Tools is probably what you use. Um, it's just, it, everybody knows it, it's very easy to go back and forth between the two. It works with a whole lot of other programs and uh, hardware, which is really inconvenient. And it also works with a program called Source Connect, which basically, Source Connect is almost like a high-tech version of a Skype call, where instead of me physically being in LA to record a video game, I can set up a Source Connect session where my Pro Tools uh, is controlled by the studio in LA. And they can, with a live feed from my microphone, direct me, give me the beats, show me whatever animation is gonna be on the screen, and direct it all from just where they are there. The only thing that's required is a solid internet connection. And uh, that like actually a lot of our characters that are, uh, all, a lot of our LA actors that are in Attack on Titan, like Lauren Landon, who's here this weekend, uh, for the last, uh, ever since season two, sorry, the last couple of years, uh, anytime we record Attack on Titan, they always record from LA. They're always, they're, they're getting up at like eight in the morning, six, six, seven in the morning and recording, uh, you know, two hours behind our time because we're, we'll have a 10 a.m. session. They gotta get up at seven to get through traffic and stuff, but they get it done. They don't have to worry about flying all the way out to Texas, getting a plane ticket, getting their hotel. They can just do it from home or do it from a, a studio that has it set up. And, it's actually not that expensive overall to set that same setup in your home, to create a, a very a decent home studio. And that actually, if you know what you're doing, you can get a lot of good work doing that. Yes? What was the name of the headset that you mentioned The, uh, it's a gaming microphone. It's called the Razer Siren. I also highly recommend the Yeti Blue, especially if you use uh, Mac as opposed to PC. If you use a PC, I would recommend the Razer Siren. I've had issues, some technical issues with the, the blue. Any other questions? Yes? Out of all the lines that like, you've gotten to say during your career, what would you be like? Out of all the lines I've gotten to say in my career, what was my favorite? Uh, let's think of one that's age appropriate. <laughs> let's, uh, let's see. Let's <laughs> see. Um, the, uh, from Yuri on Ice, actually, um, Drunk Yuri <laughs> was a lot of fun, especially because I did not know that that scene was coming up. I had not, I had not had a chance to, like, I had seen the episode, but I thought that the episode ended in the credits. So, and that whole scene takes place after the credits, so I came in, I recorded all my bits and everything about the episode, and I finished it, we got to the credits, so I was like, awesome, thanks, so I'll see you next week. He goes, get back in that box. <laughs> You've got work to do. And like I get in there and he shows me the scene for the first time. And I'm so glad that that's how it happened because if I had seen it prior, I would have been practicing and be like, oh, I'm gonna sound drunk and it probably would have sounded horrible. But instead it was like, a, oh, oh, that sounds drunk. Uh, um, hey, Victor, I got an idea. <laughs> if I were the dancer, Coco Lassitz would be my coach. You'll do that once, Victor. Be my coach. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, where does Kristoff get the dancing pole? After that, I'm still trying to figure that out. Where did the dancing pole come from? It just, he just has this like a collapsible pole. It's just like I always come prepared. <laughs> Work it, baby. So. This is quickly diverts into just a straight up Q&A. <laughs> we can continue like this if you want, or I can also uh, talk about the industry and the creative process. Anybody actually interested in learning about like uh, what goes into writing the anime, dubbing it, directing it, and everything? All right, cool. So I will just kind of start with basic, from the very beginning of the process of uh, what it takes and you know, what everything that kind of goes into buying it up to up to uh, releasing a dumb anime. And if at any point you want to have a question about something that I'm talking about, just shoot your hand up and I'll call on you. So, let's say, before you even get to writing, before you even get to subtitles, before you, know, uh, before you even get to voicing and directing, there is the acquisition of a new title by an American company 
from a Japanese company. And back in the 90s and the early 2000s, when I, when I was still very much just a fan of this, of this genre, uh, the process was very uh, heated. There, uh, any time a new, a new season was about to come up or uh, the new major uh, fiscal year for the Japanese animation uh, side of things was about to start, they would hold a massive convention in Japan that was specifically made only for industry people. It wasn't the uh, fans, you know, like there wasn't a place for fans to come, there wasn't no merchandise, anything like that. The convention was strictly for Japanese companies and American companies to get together and bid on who would get the rights to what shows that year. And people would get heated. There would be companies fighting over different titles and working out deals with other people. And sometimes you would get uh, deals of what we call uh, with friends. Uh, so let's say uh, Funimation, for example, got a, uh, let's say, uh, Negima. Anybody remember old school Negima? So uh, Negima was huge when it first came out. But at the time, there was a lot of other studios bidding on Negima, especially the second season, the reiteration of it, because it was going to be, it, was, it looked like it was going to be far more popular and far more uh, or true to the manga material. And the, uh, a lot of other people were bidding on it, and so, Funimation then was offered, they said, okay, hey, we're willing to give you this for you to dub it, but you also have to take these five to ten other titles that we made that did not do well here in Japan and try to and dub them and release them in the States so that they can try to capitalize and, and make the, the most, get the most return they can on their, their products. Nowadays, you, you, don't really, you don't really see that as much. Nowadays, especially with the onset of digital uh, and everything going to stuff like Crunchyroll and Funimation streaming service and Hulu and Netflix. Um, a lot more companies are actually putting money forward to help create the shows before bidding ever takes place. So instead, you have like, um, and, and in fact, Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood would never have happened had Funimation not fronted the money for it. Funimation actually put the money forward to help them produce that entire season, that show. So, like, and that's, again, because they put the money forward, they automatically get the rights to dub it and release it in the States. And that's a lot of what happens nowadays. You have Crunchyroll puts money back into the industry and helps uh, the companies to animate more stuff. Netflix does the same thing. In fact, they've been putting in a ton of money in the anime industry for the last couple of years, uh, funding and get, like anything that says Netflix original, you know, those animes are coming out that say Netflix original on them, chances are that they help fund and make those as well. So it's just, we're, we're at a much better place in terms of companies out there being willing to put forth the money for it because anime has become a lot more mainstream than it was when I was a kid. They're more willing to take a chance on it. So, yay for us! That's really good as an anime fan, and it's really good to be in, in the industry as well. It's, it's a really good time. So, let's say we're, uh, in fact, uh, any My Hero Academia fans in here. Alright, awesome. So, I'm sure you're all looking forward to the next season this October. So, if Funimation continues to its, its uh, happen with My Hero like we did for the last season, we will simul dub it like we do with everything. Does anyone not know what simul dub means? Anyone not know yet? All right, cool. That's perfectly fine. Got like three hands. That's awesome because a couple of years ago it was everything. Um, Simon W is basically just the process that whenever Funimation gets a product, it gets a title, instead of waiting for the entirety of the show to air in Japan before we start dubbing it, we start dubbing it immediately. The moment that an episode is out, we're already translating it, writing it, and getting it ready to be dubbed. So within a week, two weeks tops, of it coming out in Japan, the dubbed episode is out in English and ready for you to watch. So there's no wait anymore. Uh, in fact, with this most previous season of My Hero Academia, we released the dub the same day that the Japanese released because they are sending us materials a week to two weeks ahead of time now. And it's, it's, it's awesome. Uh, but it does come with a very heavy workload and a very fast-paced production schedule now as opposed to the 90s. So, Let's say uh, it's October, and the new My Hero Academia season is just about to start coming out, and uh, our translator gets the first episode materials two weeks ahead of the first street day from, uh, from the Japanese. That This could happen at like 3 in the morning for this person. They will be up at their computer, and they will immediately start 
writing in translation, which will then be checked by another translator and a translator above that at Fun Fiction. They are constantly working back and forth with the, the Japanese staff as well to make sure that we're getting the closest approximate translation as possible. And within 24 hours, they have that translation up and ready, and it's ready to be written into a dub script. 24 hours. Uh, within another 24 to 48 tops, the ADR scriptwriter then will take that episode with the translated script, which will then be used as our subtitle script. Uh, and use that to then watch every single moment in the episode where a character makes a sound, starts to talk, opens their mouth, grits their teeth, goes, oh, or anything else. And if words need to be put into those mouth flaps, they put them in. It's, you know, a lot of times we'll have to end up uh, changing the order of some words because the syntax is already flipped. Uh, from Japanese to English, if we just did raw translation, it would sound really weird <laughs> just to hear somebody talking like that. Um, so then it, the job then of the ADR scriptwriter is to kind of massage and put words around so that the exact same information that's being portrayed in the Japanese is being portrayed in the English, but it looks and sounds like it was originally made for an English-speaking audience. That's really the whole point. Um, and they do that within about 48 hours and have that episode up and ready to go, which is then checked by a head writer to make sure that everything is consistent and we have all the information from the Japanese and that that has all been taken into account. And then that episode then goes to uh, ADR script director or ADR director. And the ADR director has the hardest job out of anyone in this chain. The ADR director has to herd cats, aka actors, and you know, figure you know, figure out where they're going to put them, get the whole schedule done because they have a week to get this entire episode, twenty-five minute to thirty minute episode of anime, completely dubbed, every single character, every background thing, everything recorded, set, fully mixed, and ready to go out online. So they have to already have before within that two to three day period, while the script writers are doing their job. That director is researching everything they can about this new property. If there's a pre-existing manga, they're reading it. If there's any sort of online resource they can use or information they can get from the Japanese staff, they're getting it and taking it into account. And they have to, at all times, have this wide picture in their head about how every single thing is going to sound, how what line is going to be read what way in order, so, in order for it to make sense and uh, also picking the right people to play the characters. And when I first started, uh, almost every single show was auditioned. And we still do auditions on occasion, but a lot of times now, because, especially because Funimation has such a massive acting pool, I think it's somewhere of, in Dallas alone, they have upwards of 600 total actors that they can pull from at any given time, male and female. Um, you know, and there's some that they use more often than most, but they do have a very wide pool they can pull from. Uh, they will, more often than not, nowadays, because of the very fast time constraints in order to make sure we get this out uh, for everybody as quickly as we can, but still with a good quality, uh, they just cast it if they know what a character, you know, if like I, they can say like, oh, J. Michael Tatum has played this type of character for me numerous times. I know that he can give it his all. I know that he will sell it as it needs and play the, give the character the, what it needs to be as close to the Japanese as possible. So anybody that's watching English and Japanese will have roughly the same experience. Um, and they'll just go ahead and cast him. Uh, if they find a character, then they're just like, oh, I'm not really sure about this. They can either take a chance on a new actor that they don't know, or they can try to hold a fast audition. And it just so they can, so people can then show what they can do. Uh, and once that's done, they just go right into it. And within a week, actually, technically five days, Monday to Friday, they dub from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then they have another group that comes in from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. to record the rest of the night. So it's just it's a 12-hour-a-day process to get all this stuff recorded and done, and then it's out and it's ready for you to watch. Yes.
Uh, is it very often that the Japanese client says, we want that guy, or do they normally just leave it up to the... It depends on the studio, so you know, like Toei that does Dragon Ball and One Piece and all those guys. They're usually very particular about how they, they, they want their English counterparts to sound as close to just their ear as the Japanese do. So, like, for example, when I was auditioning for the role of the Grand Priest in Dragon Ball Super, after I did my first little bit of recording, I had to wait a month for them to send the files to Japan, let people at Toei listen to it and make sure that they were happy with my rendition if I sounded close enough to the Japanese saying that they were happy with it. And that was a very long month for me, <laughs> let me tell you. And, but finally they, they got back to me and they said, yes, we, we, we like this, we think it sounds good, we can go ahead with Josh as the Grand Priest, and now that's my character. Uh, and I probably, knowing Toei, it will not change until I'm either dead or whatever. <laughs> like, it's, uh, I'm that role for, for as long as it exists, and uh, it's because they, they are so, they're so in tune with their own product, you know what I mean? Uh, sometimes, though, but that, I would say that, at least in my experience, that's very rare. Mostly, especially uh, as fun, where Funimation is concerned, uh, the Japanese clients that they work for tend to trust them, like they've, they've developed a very solid reputation in Japan for putting out quality products and quality dubs. So they tend to just kind of let them do their thing, and if there's an issue later down the road, then they'll bring something up. Uh, yeah, usually, usually they're fairly hands off, but that's not the same for every studio. Uh, and depending, again, on the, pro on the project, uh, ADV Films a long time ago used to be the one studio for some reason in the States that uh, the people behind Starship Troopers and Halo, uh, when they uh, asked for some animation companies in Japan to make some animated editions of their properties, they would only go and work with ADV Films in Houston. But that was one of the most stressful recording processes of anyone's lives because we constantly had three representatives from Japan in the room with us at, for every session. What? And it is, you have not felt intimidated until you have had three people, Japanese businessmen in those badass suits just staring at you like, whatever comes out of your mouth is either going to save your life or end your life. <laughs> That is, <laughs> hook her up real quick. Um, and, uh, you know, especially because, like, after every single take, they'll turn the mic off and you'll just see them. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's just. Um, but yeah, depending on the show, depending on the studio, they all have different relationships and different methods of working with the clients, so the clients might expect a little bit more control or a little more say in the overall thing. Um, for example, when I wrote scripts for uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Stardust Crusaders, I had uh, constantly had the, one of the Japanese people checking every single script that I did. Unfortunately, I think the person that they had did not understand the process of dubbing because they kept asking me to give the lines shorter, like exactly how they were put in the manga. And I was like, I'm down for that. But the manga translation is three words and there's 20 flaps. <laughs> I can't, I can't just magically make that fit. And I, I just, I don't think that anyone actually explained to them what the problem was, what the process was, because they just kept saying, no, it has to be exactly like the manga. And then the directors got mad at me because they're like, why is this thing 20 flaps short? Like, why, why didn't you write more? I was just like, do you, does the right hand not know what the left hand's doing here? Like, I'm just like, please, I'm just trying to make anime. <laughs> like, I just want to make anime and make it good. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, there's, there's, there's constantly like little bitty things like that that can crop up. Because of course, if you're working with a language barrier, and there's going to be issues like that, especially in the creative industry. But thankfully, it's very few and far between. Uh, yes? I just wanted to ask a question about what Yes. In terms of like learning how to write for Bowman's Video Writer 2, like doing classes, or was it like a self-taught thing? Uh, they taught me specifically. They kind of have uh, ADD films and Foundation Entertainment. Like the, the process of ADR scripting is kind of the same across all industries. You know, whether you're bringing over a uh, an animated dub or you're redubbing over. Uh, 
you know, like if you watch like late night TV or, or something and you're watching a movie you've seen a thousand times, but like there's there's a one scene where all of a sudden the line is changed and it sounds like someone who's not that actor dubbed over that person's line or whatever. That requires ADR script writing, ADR script, stuff like that. It's the same, you know, across the whole industry. So I learned how to do ADR scripting. And uh, I also, I grew up as a, a, not only as an actor, but just as a creative. I, I studied writing, I studied art, I studied theater, as you know, all while I was growing up. So I already had those tools. I just needed to learn the ADR language, basically. So once I learned that, which, to give you an example, it's like whenever uh, you're doing an episode of Dragon Ball, for example, uh, whenever there's a massive fight scene, uh, the script for the actor as they come in, so Sean Schimmel as Goku is coming in to record this fight scene, he's not just going to watch the animation and just react to the picture, because chances are he won't remember, especially with these long bouts of animation, he's not going to remember exactly every single facial expression and stuff he's supposed to make. So we'll have code, basically, in the script, where it's a time code to signify where the episode this particular fight reaction starts. And then we'll say something like, open bracket, OM, power up, close bracket. The OM stands for open mouth. And then we have CM, power up, or CT, punch, CT, hit, uh, or kicked, or anything like that. And they just follow along this code and constantly looking back and forth between script, image, script, image. And use that as a guideline so that they don't have to remember exactly where every single reaction is. They'll know, at this second, I clench my teeth and act like I'm hit. And that's how the process pretty much goes. Uh, the, for scripting, there was another part to your question, wasn't there? It was, uh, it was script work or did I answer it? Uh, that was it, okay. <clears throat> yes. Uh, with the and then you. I don't think it's already that I asked for this. Oh, okay. Um, you know how in so many shows when at the very beginning, and by the time the episode that was just that was previous, yeah. Well, like most that have, have um, dialogue in, mm -hmm. almost all um, just from like the same dialogue, of, um, mm -hmm. same recording from the last previous. So it's Generally, it's the same. So his question, if you couldn't hear, was uh, a lot of times in shows, especially like serial shows like Dragon Ball or something, you'll have whenever the next episode comes up, there will very often be like five minutes of the previous episode sliced up into little parts that play first. And he's wondering if the dialogue that's that's there uh, is just a copy paste from the previous episode or if it's brand new. And it completely depends on whether or not when that episode is animated, if they Use, sometimes they'll use different animation for a different scene for the for a line than was originally in the other episode, so it'll be completely different flaps. Or uh, they'll cut a line in half to only signify one particular part of it, but they'll also use a completely different part of the scene. So we have to rewrite and re-record those in order to make sure that they match up. A lot of the time, though, it'll just be a straight copy and paste because they just use the exact same animation, the exact same scene, the you know, the same characters, everything, and all we have to do is just does it fit? And I just wiggle it to the left a bit. Yep, it fits fine, and we go on. So yeah, most of the time it's just an easy copy and paste, but sometimes we have to match whatever they did. You bet. Yes. Uh, if time and money went out of factor, how would you improve? Put me on the spot. <laughs> if time and money were not a factor, how would I improve it? Um, I don't know. I'm actually really comfortable with the process as it is now, to be perfectly honest. Because, you know, as a fan growing up really young, I hated having to wait six months between three episodes you know, for the next thing or something like that. Granted, that was on VHS, but even DVD was still a pretty long wait even though they were releasing six episodes, 12 episodes at a time. You still had to wait sometimes three months to as long as a year, depending on uh, contract or just whatever their release schedule was. Um, I would really enjoy the fact that I can immediately watch a brand spanking new anime that's very popular in English within a week of it coming out in Japan. I don't 
I don't think there's really much we can do to speed that up, you know, anymore. And I don't want it to speed up. I think that they found the perfect area of speed and quality. Uh, if they go any faster, I think it'll lose quality. If they go any slower, like, then people won't be happy. Because we, we, even now, we still have people being like, why does it take a week? Why can't you have it out the same day? And it's like, we're trying! And we're like, what more do you want? Anybody here old enough to remember Laserdisc anime? Where you paid 110 bucks a pop for two episodes with no extras and subtitles only and had to wait a year to get the next two episodes? I don't remember when hear anybody complain about waiting a week. Ever. Ever. Sick. We got these guys in the back of the way, and then we'll get to Yona, and then we'll get these guys. Yeah, hold on to your question, please. So, uh, for parts where there are no lift flaps for dubbing, uh -huh. so you still have lines, how much fun do you guys have with doing to go back? A lot. <laughs> uh, the great thing about anything like the shows that are off screen or, or line, dialogue that consistently happens off screen or behind a mask or something like that is the creme de la creme for all of us, director, writer, and actor. Because matching the flaps really is the most time consuming and the hardest part of this entire process, whether you're a writer, director, or actor. Fitting this dialogue into the mouth flaps to make it look as if it was originally animated for an English speaking audience takes forever. Uh, in fact, I would say some of the people that work the most in this industry, like me, are those that can do it very fast and efficiently because of the, just because of how fast we have to get this stuff done. Uh, but we have to make it look good. Um, sorry, I completely went off the tangent. What was your question? <laughs> it's like, oh, no, no, so like, do we have fun? Yes, because like generally that's when you can actually really take your time. A lot of times the flaps will really kind of set the pacing and sometimes that can feel, depending on the character, depending on the dialogue or the information you're trying to convey, that pacing can work for or against you. But when there's no flaps, that pacing is completely up to you. And you can come in and like, and, and the great thing too is like whatever, if I wrote a script and I had a, like an entire monologue or something that was off screen for a character, uh, that actor also then has the freedom to say like, to say, I'd like to take out one or two words here or put a couple of words here because I think it'll really improve the flow of this for me and I can really play with it and make it sound good and if the director agrees then they'll do that as well. And so like it really, the lack of flaps really kind of helps with, uh, opens the door for us to be a little more collaborative and a little more creative with what we're doing and, and it makes it a lot more fun and it's definitely easier. Uh, and yes, sir, the yellow. So, um, similar to this question, uh, I imagine uh, uh, when it comes to voice dubbing, the mm -hmm. fitting, like the lip syncing with the dialogues, uh, mm -hmm. is it like a critical aspect of the voice 100%. dubbing? 100%. So, yes. like, I just want to know the process of it at all. That okay. Uh, most of the process is uh, the, when you have an APR script writer starting with it, their entire job mm -hmm. is to sit there and watch the entire episode and watch each line about 20 times. Uh, and sometimes I have to go faster, obviously, because I only got like two days to write the script. But like, you watch every single bit of dialogue and these itty flaps, sometimes down frame by frame by frame, um, so that you can match the flaps exactly. And what you do is you perform the entire episode by yourself. Like, I would be at home, thank God. Thank God they didn't have me in an office or something, because I would have made a lot of people angry. <laughs> Just like, shut up, I'm trying to work. It's like, so am I. I have to, you have to say them and perform them out loud because if you're not, uh, if I'm not saying each line out loud and performing it as if I was in the booth, there's no way to know whether or not when an actor comes in and does perform it, if it's going to fit or not. So you actually have to, as a writer, be an actor as well and perform every single line that you write and then you'll, you'll be sitting there performing and you're like, oh, now that's too long, let's take away a word. Oh, now that's too short, let's change this to blah, blah, blah. And, just whatever you can. Um, and so a lot of it should already be done by the script writer because their timing is going to be fairly close to what anybody else is going to do. Some writers are a little faster than others, some are a little slower. But generally, you're able to find that middle ground and, and find that pacing. The rest of it is up to the engineer. So uh, like I can say a line and let's say I, I, I pretty much nail it and it's, it's really close, but there's one part of the line that's just a little too long. Uh, the script right, the, uh, the engineer has a lot of different tools at their disposal that they can use to, to fix that so that we don't have to do a complete retake. He can highlight that one section of the line and stretch it a little bit, 
not too far, because if you go too far, then it starts to sound and it starts to add a distortion to it, and we have to re record it anyway. But just a little bit and make it long enough so that it fits, or short enough that it fits, or they can just scoot it over to the right or to the left a little bit. We can do what we call cheating the, the line into the flaps. Um, uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of different things that they can do, and then adding effects as well that can help with it. And, uh, and they really just kind of lay down the groundwork right there, the, right there, there as we're recording. The engineers are setting up the entirety of the episode and all of our dialogue so that when it's time for the mix engineer to go in and make the 5.1 or the 7.1 mix or anything, all the files and all the lines and everything are already exactly where they need to be. And all they got to do is just mess with levels and sound effects and stuff like that. So, yeah, like the vast majority of actually matching the flaps is done by the actor and by the engineer. And uh, we have some yes, young men, and then you two, and then we'll get over here. Yes, young men. I had an actual question before that you recognized the character. Have you been young and gone? Yeah, I was uh, Jim, the blonde dragon. Hi, give me food! Japanese, you're not going to hear that because they don't hear that. They're just 
creating a story in Japanese with their language. And sometimes they'll bring in characters from like England or China or France or something like that. And they will have different personalities that the Japanese uh, associate with those countries. Like French people, uh, oh, yeah, whenever you see a French person represented in Japanese, they're always very uh, um, musical with the way that they talk. Uh, Americans are always very loud. And yeah, it's true. Um, and, and stuff like that, but they don't hear dialects. We do. And so if we're going to properly localize something so that people can know, if, if for an English-speaking person to know immediately that person's from this country, we give them a dialect. And it's it's the same thought process behind adding stuff like bro or, or modern jokes to the show, especially if the show takes place in modern times where there's modern slang and modern jokes and euphemisms and stuff like that. Does that all make sense? Does that answer your question? All right, cool. Yes. And then I'll be over to you. I was, there's something that was never quite clear on with regards to union status versus non union status. Okay. Uh, are most uh, anime cartoons union or non union? Non union. All right, right. They're almost always non union. Uh, there's actually a really big thing that we're, I mean, I don't know, it might change in the future because the industry the is always changing. And very recently, anime has become such a big thing in America. Like, it, with the, the fact that Sony Entertainment is now the owner of Funimation Entertainment, and the fact that, like, I'm pretty sure, like, Warner Brothers now has a thing with Crunchyroll. Like, they technically, no, no, Time Warner, Time Warner owns Crunchyroll now. It's like, Anime is no longer just a niche thing. We have now reached a small form of mainstream, so it's starting to change. Uh, there is a very big chance that potentially anime will go more towards SAG. Um, but right now, especially in Texas, because Texas is what we call the right to work state, uh, there is no union. Everything is, uh, everything that I do is just considered uh, contract. Uh, I am self employed. And I have to deal with all of that. that uh, everything that comes with being self-employed, I, I, I don't have union representation of any kind. Though that could change. Thank you very much. Yes, you've got the same question. Uh, yeah, what's the like, conduct embargo that we're representing in the United States? I'll tell you that it's something you're really excited for. That you just want everybody to see. I just want everybody to see it. it the question was, you couldn't hear, is like, what's the, what's the hardest? Secret or embargo that I've ever had to keep like something that I really wanted people to see, but I had to keep my mouth shut about it. Uh, and uh, actually, it's very recent. It's uh, this current season of Attack on Titan. There's a part coming up specifically with my character that I had spoiled for me about three years ago, and I have been desperately waiting for this moment to happen, and it's coming now. So, those of you who have not read the manga but have been waiting, strap in. It's going to be a rough ride. <laughs> it's going to be rough. But yeah, absolutely. And, and usually anything surrounding Titan has always been the same. So we're just like, can't talk about it. And it sucks. <laughs> yes? Uh, I had a, almost a follow up to Yoda's question. Okay. Um, in the script writing process, when it comes in from the and you get essentially the stuff, uh -huh. right? why is it a lot? I would say almost 60% of the time when you. If you watch a sub version and a dub version, the dub version, the lip gloss is there, uh -huh. and they can use, like, it takes up the same space, uh -huh. but they use a different word that almost changes the depth of the feeling. Okay. Now, to give you an example, and someone's probably going to correct me, I'm going to get this wrong. Okay. Um, Hinata, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. in season two. Of? Uh, Hi, you. Okay. Sorry. Uh, I'm not familiar with IQ, but I believe it's season two. Okay. He has this line, and in this, in the, in the sub AAB show, it was fantastic. It's uh -huh. when he goes up, he jumps above the highest, the, the tallest player in the league, mm -hmm. and he says, "I'm Hinata from Grosno, from the Grosno um, parking lot." Uh huh. But in the English version, they change it to concrete instead. But it sounded really odd in the, okay. like from the Corosso concrete or something like that. Or from, it just, it changed the depth of it. Okay. I, I don't know, visually. But it also, it happened again in, in My Hero Academia. Okay, give me, give me that one. I don't know anything about it. Well, who, who made IQ, by the way? Was that Funimation? Since I did IQ, okay. 
I was not involved with IQ and, and Sentai has very different, like not very different, but they, they, they approach stuff a little more loosely sometimes than like fun fiction will. Um, Sorry. Says but you have the script writer, because you've been there. Yeah. You have the, the translation come in. Yeah. You get essentially the sub that we're yeah. going to see. Yeah. And it gets changed to, you know, essentially, I would hope to be more relatable to an yeah. English speaking audience. But at the same time, there's, there's context within the Japanese version. But I feel that sometimes the emotion or the depth of it gets taken out. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah, I get what you mean. Um, for me, for example, uh, there's been plenty of times where, it, it, there is one thing that I, before I answer that actually that you need to understand about subtitles and the subtitle scripts and translation. The subtitle scripts that you, if you ever have watched a subtitle, it's already a truncate. You're not actually getting the translation. No subtitle that you've ever watched has ever actually been the direct translation of anything. Um, here's why. In the States, especially in North America, but mostly the States, we have a very specific set of rules that we have to follow in order to put subtitles onto the DVD disc or VHS or anything, and by extension, online. Uh, subtitles can only take up a certain number of characters on screen at any given point. So roughly the size of an old school tweet, about 120 characters. They can't take up any more than that. Um, they must be either white or yellow because that is easily seen against most backgrounds and colorblind people can see it as well. The main reason for it, how, like because of those restrictions, because of stuff like that, we cannot almost ever give the exact full translation on screen of what the line is actually saying because there's all usually a lot more information there. So usually what happens with the dub is it's actually our job and our chance then to kind of untruncate and put some of that meaning and some of those emphasis back into the show because they're lost. Because instead, because instead of giving like an entire monologue of something like a character might be giving, I mean, I'm sure you've watched plenty of scenes in the anime where it seems like a character is just saying this, like having this soliloquy basically, but the translation is like two lines. <laughs> and it's like, the reason is because they're actually saying a lot more. There's a lot more nuance and meaning to the stuff they're saying, but because we are limited in how much information text-wise we can have on screen at any given time, we have to truncate it down to the most literal basic information of what's being said. So you actually end up losing more than you gain. Uh, and then it's our job as to, when we're dubbing it to try and bring some of that nuance back into it. For what you're talking about, that kind of situation, I can't speak for Sentai in terms of IQ, but I can speak to stuff like uh, My Hero Academia. There's actually an instance where this happened for my character, Tokoyami. Uh, if you, if anybody remember the episode, the training camp that they do outside in the woods, and you know, just before, uh, you know, Tokoyami's throughout the whole episode is constantly saying, "Revelry in the dark." <laughs> and why did he say that? <laughs> and, in the original translation, like the full translation was Mad Banquet of Darkness, which sounds badass, but one issue, it didn't fit the flaps. So instead, what we went with was Revelry in the Dark, which a revelry, loosely defined, or even if you look it up in the dictionary, a revelry is described as a wild party or banquet. Bang, mad Banquet of Darkness, Revelry in the Dark. It's literally the exact same thing. It just happens to fit the flaps a little bit more. I would also, I would kind of argue that saying that someone was of the parking lot instead of, and instead saying of the concrete is also relatively the same thing. Because concrete, I mean, parking lots are usually made of concrete. And I feel like what he's trying to say is more of like, I am of, like, I am of this, existence, like anything that has to do with the concrete is my domain. And that's at least one way you can say it, but again, I don't know how you, so I can't really speak to it all that much. Yes. Okay. Sometimes like five copies, but I'm pretty sure the original, I think this stuff was actually there for like less than concrete or something, like they're from concrete, and so it might have been part, I haven't seen it yeah, he talks about parking lot sounds called trees and mountains. Uh -huh. yeah. Right, but he's of the concrete. Yeah, we're like, right. Mm -hmm. 
I'm from the city. Yeah. It's a really badass moment, really. Uh, gotcha. An actual location, right. So, I mean, a lot of times that's going to come down to, I think, again, inter personal interpretation and also there could very easily have been a communication in the background between the writer, the script writer, and someone on the Japanese staff about exactly what that was supposed to mean. And there, it's very possible that parking lot was a mistranslation and that it, in fact, was supposed to say concrete. Uh, because a lot of times we'll just have words that Japanese will say one thing, but it can mean one or two other things in our language. So we kind of have to, you kind of have to play it by ear. And a lot of times having conversations with the Japanese staff and creators really helps us to kind of narrow that down. But even then, with those conversations and with translators, you don't always get an exact one-to-one -one translation. There's always going to be a little bit of something lost. Um, and it's, it's unfortunate, but there's not really much we can do about that. So our, our best tool then in those situations is to just stick to the original intention of what the Japanese are trying to do. And I'll give you an example of that as well. Uh, jokes. You know, any time the Japanese handle jokes, especially so much of their humor is, is layered in puns. They love their puns. Wordplay and everything is especially, is especially you, people kind of look at you as being uh, smarter, I guess, is, uh, in, in Japan if you, if you know how to make a good pun. Uh, there is absolutely zero translation for a Japanese pun that works as a pun in English. It just doesn't exist. Um, so a lot of times then, if we're in a situation where we have this, especially like a show that is nothing but puns, we have a decision to make. Do we do exactly straight translation, raw translation, as close to that as we possibly can, dub it that way, with the syntax unflipped and with you know everything written exactly as it was, and then maybe one out of every 100 people in the United States that watch that will get every single joke because they know Japanese, they know the culture, they know the different regional dialects, the different celebrities, the different pop cultures, everything. Like, you have all that information in order to get those jokes. Or do we broaden the joke to something that all 100 people in the States that watch that would get? For example, there was a show we did a few, uh, way back in like 2007 called The Wallflower. Uh, and there's a joke, there, there's a scene at one point where one of the young male characters is very passionately eating a popsicle. <laughs> and uh, in the Japanese, he's humming the jingle for a very popular Japanese ice cream that's only in one particular region of Japan. And again, so we're at the point now where do we just redub and have our actor do that jingle that maybe one out of 100 people in the States would understand that reference, or do we change it to be something that's more inclusive? So instead, we have the character hum the Klondike bar song <laughs> while he's eating the popsicle. And it's, it's the exact same joke, just in a context that more people would get for the localization. Does that make sense? So yeah, that's, that's usually the type of stuff that we're trying to do and, and, and the, the issues that we're working with. And unfortunately, sometimes little things slip through the cracks. So the, the concrete and slash uh, parking lot thing could have just been a mistake on our part. It could have been a mistake in translation. Um, or it could have been a, uh, it could actually, the same concrete instead of parking lot could actually have been a fix to make it more in line with it. Unless I actually, you know, research IQ and talk to the Sentai folks, I couldn't give you a definite answer. I'm, I'm sorry about that, but that's just my thoughts on it. Uh, who, who with a hand up has not asked a question yet? Okay, you, and then we'll get all four of you. Let's uh, we'll get back to you. Yes. Okay. She's asking what my favorite line to say is Kurinosuke from Princess Jellyfish was. Did anybody ever see Princess Jellyfish? Yeah. Okay, a couple people, that's cool, yeah. One of my favorites. Um, Kura... Really, I think my favorite thing with anything with Kura is um, whenever he's messing with his brother, Shu. So, like, Ian Sinclair, uh, Ian Sinclair who plays Shu, he's one of my best friends, he used to be my roommate um, while we were recording this show, so we had a lot of fun with that. Um, 
he's constantly messing with his brother, trying to get him to go out with Tsukimi. And I think my favorite guy was just like, oh, uh, by the way, bro, she's a virgin. And it's just like, I think it was like, you just see him like, Whoa! and he just loses it. And I was like, Curry, you were such a dork. I love him. And also, just any time that he gets like all up in arms about fashion, especially what he's wearing, like, uh, he shows up to the house one day and he's just causing all sorts of mayhem for Tsukimi uh, and uh, not really paying attention to the stuff that she's trying to do and she's wanting him to leave, but he's just like, oh no, I love this place. And she's like, by the way, what, what, what is that you're wearing anyway? And he just suddenly snaps out of whatever funk he's in and goes, oh, this, this is 20s Lolita. And like, this is Lolita, French Lolita meets 20s flapper. <laughs> And he just you know, does his hair or whatever, and she's just like, oh, great. <laughs> yeah, he's a dork. I love him. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you said that you were trained in uh, directing, but never actually got a uh, directing credit or applied. So, right. Do you have any experience from either looking at the directors or from what they tell me? Hang on just one second for the new check. Uh, this was supposed to just go till two, correct? Yeah. yeah. I know that the other panel started late. Are we are we actually at time now? Or, okay. Do you do I need to just stop now, or can we go over a little bit more? Or is there a panel? Aaron, do you have a panel in here? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. All right. Cool. Actually, that's we should stop now. I'm so sorry. I, I wasn't paying attention to time. Thank you guys so much. I hope you learned something. And thank you so much for the great questions.